Good morning, everyone. How are you? Welcome to the Lyceum. We're so happy to see so many people here this morning in such lively conversation. It's wonderful. I'm Jane Peters. I work for the Partnership for Strong Communities, and I am the Events and Building Manager here at the Lyceum. The Partnership for Strong Communities is a statewide housing policy organization supported by the Melville um, Charitable Trust, and we work to create affordable housing and um, end homelessness throughout the entire state of Connecticut. Uh, we're very proud of the accomplishments that we've made thus far. We've um, helped to end homeless, uh, homelessness for veterans in the state of Connecticut. We're on the threshold of ending crom chronic homelessness. We've seen dramatic decreases in these numbers. And this year we're taking on a very uh, large task of ending youth and family homelessness in Connecticut. And it is a very large task. Um, just some information, there's over 4,000 youth in Connecticut that are homeless and over 300 families. So that's when you come here today, all of the rental revenues that we make go to support our mission um, and to dramatically change those numbers, hopefully by 2020. Um, as for the Lyceum, we're very proud to call it home. We are a green building, so we appreciate the fact that you are trying to recycle and compost today. That's really cool. So thank you so much for that. Um, history on the building, it was built by the Archdiocese of Hartford in 1895. Um, it was then owned by the Hartford Box Company. Then it was owned by the Lithuanian American Society until the mid 80s. Um, and then it was a hot air balloon manufacturer, and then it became a punk rock club called The Lit. Apparently the hot spot in Hartford, very popular spot. Um, I've been told that someone saw the Ramones here, so there's some history here. If the walls could talk, we'd hear some really good stories. Uh, they also turned, the, I believe it was the first floor, into a roller skating rink at one time, and then there were Friday night dances held in this very room that were all in right now. The Melville Trust, though, wanting to um, create a, a housing policy center in Connecticut, bought and renovated the building in 2003, and we all moved in in 2004. And the Lyceum has been a resource for many different types of events, conferences and workshops and, and speeches, and uh, we've had political candidates come out and, and um, make their announcements. We recently had Jessica Pimentel from Orange is the New Black here. So a lot of exciting stuff, and not to mention a couple of weddings another one coming up in June which is very exciting so we have unique meeting space and we're very proud of it and we're very happy to welcome you all here very thankful to Lori for bringing you all here and I thought I would end with a couple of interesting facts about Hartford I don't know if you know that the old state house is the oldest state house in America the Buckley Bridge is the largest stone arch bridge in the world it was built in 1905 Aetna Life Insurance erected the world's largest colonial style structure. Um, and the Hartford Current is the oldest continuously published newspaper in America. I thought that was pretty cool. And the collection at the Wadsworth Athenaeum spans over 5,000 years. Somebody dropped off these facts to me the other day and I thought I'd share them with you. Have a wonderful meeting. Thank you for being here. Hi. My name is JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. Good morning. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. My name is Amy Murley. I'm the chair of the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters, and I'm here with Wildelise Bermudez. As board members, we would like to officially welcome you to the annual Environmental Summit. Thank you for coming. And thank you to our event sponsors, Valerie Friedman Fund and Consumers for Sensible Energy. As you may have noticed, we didn't charge this year, which is thanks to their support. However, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that we'd appreciate any contributions or future contributions that you would make. I know Jonathan got some of you guys at the door, though. As an artist and entrepreneur, I've always focused on environmentalism. I look at things through a creative lens and bring a fresh perspective, as most young people do. 
I know that I am not alone when I say we all recognize there's a lot of work to be done in regard to the environment. And so today, we come together as environmental advocates, legislators, activists, youth leaders, elected officials, parents, residents, a community, to work across various party lines to delve deeper into the environmental work that is very much needed in our state. Last year, we collectively spoke out on Twitter, organized on Facebook, we signed petitions, we used as many platforms as we possibly could, but most importantly, we showed up for dis demonstrations. Last year was challenging to say the least, but we discovered some amazing allies to fight for the environment. Now, more than ever, we're in a unique position to connect with new, passionate environmental groups that are sprouting up throughout Connecticut. These groups are meeting all over our state. These groups are connecting online and in real time on issues that impact Connecticut. They're holding meetings in living rooms and coffee shops and they're ready to show up, call their legislator and hold people accountable. I keep meeting more people like me who want to get involved in the environment, especially young people, who want to refocus their frustrations and turn them into actions. One way to be certain our environment stands a chance is to invest in these new groups. We need to keep the conversations going, we need to invest in our youth, invest in underserved communities. As we fight for the environment, we need to truly consider who will be most severely impacted by the decisions made. We recognize that that change starts with all of us. Change can begin with what's discussed here today in this room. And that's why we are all here, so that we, our efforts can have a greater impact. Our belief and our strength in numbers, we can succeed. On that note, I would like to introduce my fellow board member, CHISPA Program Director, Wildelise Bermudez. Thank you, and good morning to all of you. Thanks for being here. As an environmental community, our work continues to grow now more than ever, with a lot more fervor than before. And we are thankful to have so many environmental advocates here in, the, in this room, leaders. And as our chair, Amy, said, we are thankful for all of the new groups that are here today, and, and also individuals that have emerged at the present alongside those of you who have been doing this work for decades tirelessly. And so we have much to learn from one another. We recognize that. And we have much to learn from those who have been doing the work for a very long time. And so I'm, like Amy said as well, I'm also happy to see these new faces in the room. And so thank you for being here as well. We all recognize that the environment is an issue that impacts everyone each one of us. At times, however, certain groups are not at the table or even considered. Whether it's by default or by design, whether it's intentional or not, we must recognize that young people, communities of color, underserved communities must also be included and must also be present when we talk about the environment. All of us understand that it is our responsibility to work across party lines, to be inclusive. But let's also acknowledge that we must work across zip codes, rural areas, suburbs, cities. Let's not forget about the cities, cities like Hartford, Bridgeport, Waterbury, New Haven, New London. We, was, we must all work together because at the end of the day, we are all part of the living environment. And we are all part of the environmental community. In Connecticut, our environment is in a state of emergency. All of us in this room recognize that. And now more than ever, we have to plan ahead with fierce determination and focus to work on the things that matter the most to us, our planet, or else our legacy for the future generations will be compromised. We must do this now before we have nothing left to fight for. And boy, do we have a lot to fight for. 
We must intentionally engage and invest in the populations that are most impacted by climate change. Groups like CHISPA, through CTLCV and the National League, we have made a concerted effort to bring more voices to the table, to provide a pathway to take action. And I know that many groups represented here today are also doing the same. And again, we thank you for that effort. Let's also be, be inclusive in bringing into our work those US citizens who have arrived at our doorsteps here in Connecticut, fleeing from climate change disasters in Puerto Rico. Right now, there are seven major communities across Connecticut receiving climate change refugees from Puerto Rico. These families are arriving to Connecticut after losing everything they ever worked for. And they're here because of Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria. Our future in Connecticut is inextricably linked to climate change refugees who are arriving. For instance, in Hartford, we have already seen 1,300 individuals and 400 children have already registered to actually be part of the public school system. And so they're enrolled. So let's make an effort to talk to these families and include them in our conversations about the environment. For they are the frontline survivors of what climate change looks like. Among them, these are Puerto Rican families who were farmers, fishermen, teachers, nurses, these US citizens completely displaced. They are environmentalists who believe strongly that air, water, land, natural resources must be protected. They are the voices who have informed us what the future might bring if we don't plan for the environmental sustainability that we want to see in our great state of Connecticut. We must do everything in our power to include them in our fight, for their fight is our fight. It's our own. Today, these US citizens are climate refugees, but tomorrow this may very well be us which is why we need things like a water mitigation plan to protect our spaces and also plan for renewable energy. And the list goes on and on. You know what the list is because you have been working tirelessly for decades to make sure that we have a better environmental sustainability plan throughout all of our towns in Connecticut. So let's use their plight as an omen for what the future might look like if we don't act now. As their lives unravel and right in front of us, it shows us how truly frail our planet is. And together, we must all do everything in our power to conserve what we have. And that's why we're all here. We are all here because we care, we're passionate, we love the environment, we want to make sure that we see better communities where we live and throughout the entire state. And that's the essence. But also, let's not forget that time, time is ticking. And so we have to be very mindful of making sure that as we continue to work tirelessly and mindfully, inclusively, that we do it with a focus and we do it now. And with that, I would like to now introduce Melissa Everett of Clean Water Action, who is a phenomenal activist in her own right and will moderate her skills today. Thank you. Conservation Voters CHISPA program and I'm so happy to be here at this environmental summit with our newest board member. Hi, I'm Sandra DiDonato. Uh, I was an intern at the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters uh, last fall and now I am uh, the newest C3 board member. It's very exciting and we're here at the summit, 2018 summit. Um, and we're really excited because while it's been a really challenging year, it was a challenging year last year for the environment both at the national level and at the state level, 
there's a lot of work to be done and what we've seen is that out of such a frustrating year we have seen new people new groups new allies that have come to the surface and have said we are want to do something we're passionate about the environment and we're here to act how can we help yeah, so basically our focus is, you know, educating the public, educating, you know, young people to get involved. Um, you know, the Chispa program is, is really blossoming um, across the nation, really. And we're just, we're just so happy to, uh, you know, put the work in and we're, we're ready. And we're really happy to have new people join our effort in creating the future environmental leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Water panel coming on up, come on up. David Sutherland, Alicia Sharma, and Margaret Miner. Uh, David from the Nature Conservancy will give a big picture on the importance of water planning and allocation. Um, Alicia will describe what's about supposed to happen, needs to happen to get the plan approved and explain uh, the complex issue of registration diversion. Um, and Margaret will raise a really important uh, issue that's just come back on the radar. Uh, is water a public trust or not? Um, panelists will introduce themselves and they will model tightness and seven minutes each. That's right. <laughs> is Margaret in the room? Mark's on her way. Margaret, I will okay. defy the other panels to uh, duplicate our carefully choreographed entree onto the stage. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, done with well military-like precision. Just a little bit of advocacy on the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. Um, in most years, in a typical year, uh, Connecticut's very fortunate in that we usually have ample rainfall and precipitation. And compared to many parts of the year, our precipitation is pretty pretty evenly distributed throughout the year. Um, but even in some of these typical years, to say nothing of some of our drier years, we've still got parts of our state, we've still got communities where there is deep concern that we're not, we don't have enough water right now for human needs, or we don't have enough for the projected increases in human need for water. And we've still got streams uh, where there's insufficient water to support healthy fish populations and other aquatic organisms. We've had some notorious cases, fortunately not too many of those, but we've had some cases where streams have literally been sucked dry, completely dry with significant fish kills. Um, but I think it's really important to stress that you don't have to completely dry up a stream in order to create conditions that are going to be unsustainable for aquatic life. Um, certainly, uh, you might drive over the stream on your, your way to work every morning in your neighborhood, drive over the bridge, and everything looks beautiful. There's sunlight reflecting off the water in the screen, stream, the trees are beautiful. But if the water levels are significantly and consistently lower than we'd get in natural conditions. Um, fish, in many cases, are not gonna be able to survive and they're, or they're not gonna be able to reproduce. So you won't see a lot of dead fish around. They just won't be reproducing over, over a period of years. Um, in some cases, natural drought conditions, natural meteorological trends or occurrences can create these stressful conditions. But all too often, uh, these stressful conditions are created by our use of water that's either poorly informed uh, in terms of, of the knowledge we need to know about stream levels, or uh, there's been poor planning done, or the planning and knowledge have been ignored, or the regulations that are supposed to govern our use of water have been inadequate. So for many years, uh, river advocates and a lot of other interested parties have been pushing for comprehensive planning around our use of water, um, our use of land as it affects our, our, our water supplies, and around water conservation so that we can 
determine the best and, and the fairest ways of allocating the water in our streams. So, well, and, and also the water underneath the ground in our, in our aquifers so that all parts of the state have adequate water for our uses and for fish and other aquatic organisms. Um, this type of planning to do it properly gets, involves a lot of aspects that get very complicated very quickly, whether we're thinking about a better scientific understanding of the quantities and levels of water we need in different types of streams at different times of the year to support different aquatic species. Uh, it gets very complicated when we think of the laws <coughs> governing water, our use of water, and the history of those laws, which in some cases stretches back centuries um, in common law. The technology and the mechanics of how we manage water, filter it, distribute it, are very complicated. What are the best techniques for irrigating agricultural areas for different types of crops? Um, and then what are the financial aspects? How do we value water? How do we price it? Um, how do we charge ourselves in effect for the water that we need? How do we fairly compensate the water co companies? And they range from very large to very tiny, privately owned, investor owned, municipal, regional. How do all of those different types of water companies get fairly compensated for the infrastructure that they're building and maintaining and operating? And then there's the simple aspects of it, like the politics. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so speaking of politics, um, as you'll see in the notes here in the, in the, in the folder, uh, in 2001, the legislature established the Water Planning Council, which is comprised of four agencies, DEEP, the Department of Public Health, the Office of Policy and Management, and the Utility Regulators, PURA, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. And the legislature charged that council with addressing issues, uh, what was it? Addressing issues regarding water companies, water resources, and state policies which, re which affect future drinking water supplies. Um, and they set up an advisory committee comprised of many stakeholders, um, and they also established six subcommittees to deal with those different aspects of water planning. And I think the results over the next decade or so ranged from the very, very productive and good analysis and discussion and reports to the, let's say, excruciatingly frustrating. Um, so in 2014, the legislature uh, revisited the issue and uh, called on the past legislation which uh, mandated that the Water Planning Council create, develop a comprehensive water plan that would balance a lot of these different aspects. And they gave them, importantly, they gave them several hundred thousand dollars to hire a consultant who has been working for the past year and a half with the steering committee for the water plan, the Water Planning Council Advisory Committee, to address all of these issues and uh, develop a 630 page plan. Uh, just earlier this week, the Water Planning Council voted to approve that plan for its submit submission to the legislature. And uh, they'll be taking it up this session. And my colleagues here are gonna talk about some of the issues that came up in a little more detail. <laughs> So um, before getting into the issues, um, I just want to give you all information about what happens next. Now, um, I, I think when uh, we were sitting up here last year during the, the summit, there were a lot of us that wondered if this plan was going to be done for submission to the legislature. And I'm very pleased that the process has come to where it is now so that we have this plan to submit to the legislature this session. So what happens next is that this plan goes to, and I can't remember if it's four or five committees of cognizance within the legislature. Um, there will hopefully be one public hearing <laughs> for the state water plan and not four or five in each committee. Um, we all have our fingers crossed for that. 
And each committee will either send the, the plan back to the Water Planning Council for revisions or approve it to send on to the General Assembly. Obviously, it's got to be approved by all of the committees of cognizance in order for the General Assembly, or in order for it to go to the General Assembly. So if the revisions, the revisions could take longer if they require um, you know, a, a little bit more thought and stakeholder input. Um, they, that water plan can come back this session, but it could come back the next session to those four committees of cognizance again. Um, again, it has to be approved by the entire General Assembly in order for this plan to be ready for implementation. So within 24 months of submission to the legislature, if this plan is not approved by the entire General Assembly, it goes to the governor to say yes or no. What happens if he says no is not clear right now. But one of the important things to note here, and I think a lot of you have already seen the draft plan that was out for public comments, um, are familiar with um, what the plan has done well and what still lacks. This process is not done once the General Assembly approves the plan. There is still a lot of work. Some of the very hard issues were not brought about to full stakeholder consensus. Um, one of those big issues is registered diversions. Well, the, the plan does have a good pathway forward for obsolete and unused registered diversions. It, it, we didn't have time to really solve the hard issue of the problems that registered diversions <laughs> cause. And this must be addressed in order for us to have a truly good and consistent decision-making process. Now, I've heard um, during some public comments during Water Planning Council meetings, um, there are some entities that say, we're really tired of seeing you know, a, a certain kind of bill coming to the legislature every session about water. Well, these kind of bills come to the legislature because we have a system, we, we don't have a public process in every instance in how our water is managed. So the only pathway forward for the public, for users of, of you know, for um, users of water for public health, for users of water for recreation, is to go through the legislative process. And if we can make, if we can solve the problem, and. I guess I should back up and explain what a registered diversion is. I'm assuming that all of you know. So when the uh, Water Diversion Act was um, developed in the 80s, they had to do something about people that already had water rights. So what they did was they asked the people who already had water rights to register their diversion with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And they pretty much have rights to that water, the entire amount that they had registered for in perpetuity, there was never an environmental review on this. So within a certain area, the, the entity that owns this water right can, um, can use water within that particular area. And, and sometimes that area is small, and sometimes it's fairly far reaching to where if they want to transfer water from one area to another, such was the case with um, MDC and Yukon several years ago, if people don't have an opportunity to, to, um, to have a say about where that water goes. And it, it was very apparent to people within when that controversy was happening that just because they have it here and they want it here doesn't necessarily mean that it can automatically happen. There has to be a better decision-making process. So unless we really address the issue of registered diversions, we can't have that very good decision-making process. Sure. So um, you understand it's going to go to the legislature, and um, there are actually a couple of legislators here. I would like to be sure they're held accountable, so perhaps they would. I saw Tony Wong. Tony, are you here? I saw Representative Steinberg. Are there others that we missed? Would you like to be sure? Oh, please, please. <laughs> And let's, uh, let's be sure we acknowledge and welcome the legislators and have them all stand up. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, back to the 
I guess I, I didn't circulate enough at the breakfast. <laughs> There's some very important legislators here now that I look around, and we're relying on you. Um, one of the water issues that has come up to the legislature, and they're hoping that the plan will address, is how do you manage uh, water in a drought? We've had a, a couple of years of severe summer droughts, one fairly mild. We're in what they're calling now a stealth drought. So legislators, um, the state has been working on a new drought management plan since uh, 2003, I believe, um, and they're close, but understandably with droughts happening, there's a good deal of impatience. So one thing we're really looking for is that this plan will realistically um, address who, who does drought management, how it's handled, and um, who, who gets to decide. Another, a bill, legislators introduced quite a good bill last year, and they may do that again, the, um, which will raise the question of what should be in the water plan, and are there aspects of the problems that we face that perhaps should be addressed in some other way. Ideally, drought management will be in the water plan. Drought management raises the question, as I'm sure many of you heard, who gets to allocate the water? Who decides? If there's a low flow um, and low reservoirs, and there's a new high volume user that moves into the neighborhood, and obviously I see people nodding, they might be thinking of Niagara water bottling in Bloomfield, but the problem exists statewide. You, th there are stress watersheds. There are high volume users. The state often wants high volume users. Who decides what the rules are for that and how the water gets allocated in a drought? That has led that question of whose water is it and how do you decide who gets it in times of stress has led directly to our latest most um, interesting controversy. Uh, in, the water in the state water plan, there was a debate in the last few weeks whether there sh it should be um, made apparent and stated as important that the principle that water is a public trust resource is the foundational principle um, in, in Connecticut for uh, allocation and uh, decision making for um, a natural resource. This principle is embodied in our Connecticut Environmental Protection Act, uh, but it's um, if you look at the wetlands law, it appears to be very firmly stated there. That doesn't mean it's easy to um, codify, to put into regulations, but it is a uh, guiding principle. Most people think, but some people think uh, that it's too complex or too ambiguous, uh, and there has been, um, as, as you may have heard, advocacy to uh, leave that concept for discussion later. Um, it, uh, the Water Planning Council has affirmed that principle, which is good news, but I think as we go forward, we want to keep that in mind. Um, saying that water isn't the public trust is a little bit like saying government isn't for the people. Okay, you don't have a whole lot of laws that say government is for the people, but it is something you kind of assume. And with the water, it's a very similar situation. Water is for the people and it should be managed sustainably for current, who's here now, and who's coming up. So keep an eye on that. It's going to be a very interesting year. coming my way. I believe there has been a basket or bowl circulating uh, to capture your questions. And does anyone know where that is? Yep. Okay. Okay. The well-oiled machine continues. Um, <laughs> mean, while we're getting questions, would, would one person like to model asking a brief Genuine question. <laughs> Lori. And I think part of the you know part of the problem is getting there. Why we're here. I saw something on the news about uh, other countries 
for example, Cape Town, Africa, and the percentage of water that we use in the United States versus what they use in Africa. Africa uses 19 gallons. Oh, now they have to actually ration. We use 100 gallons average a day. So, so is I, your question about how we can manage and reduce that? Yeah, I think that's okay, a great decision. <coughs> great, thank you. Comment? It's important. So there are some very good policy recommendations and other recommendations within the water plan for conservation and not just conservation in drought. Um, water reuse, um, using the um, the best water, using the, the appropriate water quality for the use. <laughs> However, it needs to be stronger and more enforceable, in my opinion. When, you know, the peak usage is during the summertime when we have less rainfall. That peak usage is not for public health. It's for green lawns. Um, and, and the strength in which, which the message goes out when we begin to go into drought is laughable at, at times. Um, and, and for the amount of time that it often extends into drought, that, that lack of uh, educating the public that they need to use less water and let the lawn go brown so we all have water to drink. Cape Town, in the middle of April, will have no water left. Cape Town will be providing six and a half gallons of water a day to 3.7 million people at 20 distribution session stations. And you know what? I bet 20 years ago, somebody said, that'll never happen. And this is the time where we need to start really putting very strong measures in place to educate the public on how they can use water more um, efficiently because you can have nice landscaping if you do it correctly and use a lot less water um, and, and reduce that peak demand during times when we don't get the rainfall. Oh, great. Thank one, you. one cure that we have looked at for that is as currently for most water companies, their revenue depends upon how much water they sell. We, we had the very similar situation with energy. There needs to be decoupling. About three years ago, a law passed that it, it sets up a procedure for private water companies where they can uh, have a sustainable revenue flow. Um, I believe that um, process should be extended to the municipal and regional water suppliers as well. That provides a, an incentive or at least a uh, no penalty for doing conservation as a water supplier. And I think when we think of water conservation, it's also really interesting or, or necessary to think about uh, energy consumption, that even those of us who are on private wells and septic systems where you can think, well, probably if I'm not using it for irrigation and it, and it gets evaporated, that the water I'm using my house is probably ending up in the same basin <laughs> and all. It's probably okay. But every gallon of water I use, particularly every gallon of water that I heat, is consuming significant amounts of energy. So I think it's it's wiser use of water is both water conservation and energy conservation. Great, okay. Uh, once approved, can the water plan be amended and if so, by what process? Quickly. Well, the process is iterative. Um, and that's the reason, um, something I did not point out when I said there's still work to do, that by, so in five years, there will be a second iteration of of the water plan. So it will be changing and we will be working toward a better plan through that iteration. That's why I said the work does not stop. So yes, um, okay, there will great. be an opportunity for change. Thank you. Uh, water will be the oil of the 21st century. What do we do about industrialists who have vowed not to rest until every drop of water on earth is privatized? <laughs> Who wants it this? <laughs> uh, talk with your legislators, your elected officials, your Congress people, and just keep talking about this. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to point out that in Connecticut, we have private companies, public companies that are regional, which are quasi um, public agencies and municipal. Curiously, perhaps, the private companies are regulated through Pura with their rate structure. So they frequently have better management practices required of them 
in their rate structure applications that are not required of the private and regional companies who have to go back and raise taxes, <laughs> typically, or fees. So it's, you know, the privatization, I think, itself, in most parts of the world, is the real issue. Here, I think it's, it's managing water, again, for the public benefit, not for the, um, uh, not for the benefit either of a someone who wants to get elected again or who has a very good salary for uh, having some role in a public company. Right. This is why and the public trust doctrine should be foundational. Yeah, and there's a related question. I'll just touch briefly in the you know in the next phase um, and in the public trust framing. Um, questioner wants to know: Is there a way to establish priorities for uses? Maybe. <laughs> Prioritization seems to be a hot potato <laughs> in, in the water planning process. Do you agree? Um, okay. I, I, think, I think when in, in the drought management, this is where, um, where we really have to look at um, what triggers exist for different users. Um, and and there, don't, there, there need to be no changes for this. The Department of Public Health already has the power to say yes or no to a plan that a water utility presents on their drought triggers. Um, whether they exercise that or not and the strength to which they exercise that so that we all have access to water to public health Thank is, you. Okay. is questionable. Beautiful. And if I could just say, I remember like a decade ago dealing with a water issue far from here but talking to a local elected official, not in Connecticut, who said, my teenage kids take 25 minute showers. I'm powerless. <laughs> I want to digest that because I think what we really, what we saw a, a, you know, a few years ago with the Niagara issue and the discovery of it and the engagement of citizens and what we see when we're at our best is we are not powerless and we need a whole different dimension of leadership. I believe. So thank you, Water Panel. Family therapy. Okay. Hi, my name is Tony Huang. I am the state senator from the 28th Senate District. Um, I'm thrilled to be here um, at the annual meeting because the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters is such a tremendous asset to our communities in, in raising awareness, education, and being able to promote the issues that are so clearly necessary and important in our community about the environment. Uh, for me, it is absolutely critical in this time and age to raise the awareness and educate and separate the facts from the hyperbolese. And it is really important to understand that, that we as stewards of the environment should not only care about it on Earth Day, but it should be every day. Um, and in light of the, the, the disconnect between the federal government and the current status of the EPA to what we need to do in the state of Connecticut, we can make a, an impact versus some of the federal EPA mandates that are coming down the, the pike. So it's really important for people to act, to be engaged, to be educated. So, so I think for me that that is critical. Um, but on a legislative side, I, I want to offer that when we talk about conservation, when we talk about environmental activism, that there has to be a clear cost-benefit analysis. It isn't just enough to say it's the right thing to do. Of course it's the right thing to do. But we have to bring in a cost-benefit analysis to justify that it is beneficial not only to the environment of clean air and clean water, but it also creates jobs, creates businesses. And that really is a wonderful complement to being win-win. So I hope this is a opportunity to share our message, but also for people to be engaged and to be more aware.
the land panel comes on. Um, and we have uh, Amy Patterson from the Connecticut Land Conservation Council, Karen Bernaska from the Connecticut Fund for the Environment, and Eric Hammerling from Connecticut Forest and Park Association. Um, and again, we're gonna basically do three consecutive panels and then some conversation. Uh, you'll thank us at the end of the day for being tight through the day. Um, and again, in case anyone came in, there's tons of material in your packet, lots of time for discussion at lunch, and thanks to uh, Summit Sponsors Consumers for Sensible Energy, Valerie Friedman Fund, and the Summit Planning Committee. And um, I just want to have a 30-second rowdy applause for Lori and the League. Okay, thanks to our land. Go for it. So we'll take it away. Um, again, I'm Amy Patterson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Land Conservation Council, which is the umbrella organization for Connecticut's land conservation community, working most particularly with the land trusts. So I have been asked to kick this off by talking about the status of, of land conservation in Connecticut. And when I was thinking about this last night, I was, I was thinking, what would I entitle this? And I was thinking, what's new? Not much. <laughs> so the status of land conservation in Connecticut, and I'm gonna be looking down a bit because I have a lot of numbers in front of me, and they're important numbers, and that's why I'm gonna talk about them. So under the Connecticut General Statutes, and it's section 23-8B, if you're interested, we have set a goal for conserving 21% of the state's land area. Of that, 10% of that is going to, should be conserved by the state of Connecticut, and 11% by partners, and that would consist of towns, water companies, and land trusts. The Green Plan, which is the state's comprehensive land, open space, uh, comprehensive open space strategy, set the goal of conserving that 21% by the year 2023. So how are we doing? Not much new. According to DEEP's 2016 annual report, which is the most recent report that we've been working off of, and so the numbers have changed a little bit, but the state and the partners have conserved about 500,000 acres, which gets us about 75% of the way there, which sounds really pretty good until you get down in the weeds and you really start to look at those numbers. When, when I was preparing for this, I went back to my notes from the de December 2015 summit and I saw that I had referenced um, the most recent open space awards and the press release that had been um, issued by the governor's office stating that in awarding these um, grants to the um, partners, it got us 75% of the way there to reaching our goal, which is where, really where we are right now. The needle has not moved very much at all. And to put that in perspective for you, that in order to reach our goal of 21% by the year 2023, which is really now, let's just say it, it's unattainable and everyone, and everyone acknowledges that, DEEP would have to acquire over 8,900 acres a year. And in 2016, they only acquired 516. Partners, 15,000 acres a year. And in 2016, they acquired 2,200. And these numbers are, are not 100% accurate, but they're pretty close. So reaching 21% by 2023 is again clearly unattainable and without significant investment into our land conservation programs, and we have them, we have to invest in them, we're never going to get there. And that's because when land is gone, it's gone forever. But here's what else is not, not new. The land conservation community is undeterred. They are moving forward, they are overcoming these challenges and they are doing whatever it takes to get the land saved. And I'm not just talking about the towns and the land trusts and the water companies, although they are doing a tremendous amount of work, but I'm also talking about DEEP and I'm talking about the federal government, that despite all of these challenges, every one of us as partners are moving forward to conserve land in our communities. So what do we do to help them? They wanna do it, we wanna help them, what do we do? And this is not new either. We need to continue to invest in the programs that we have. We have an open space and watershed land acquisition grant program, which has really been the backbone of the work of the partners. And that is a program funded for, through bonding, but bonding for that program has not been released since 2014. But it's also funded consistently through the Community Investment Act, which is, as most of you know, and if you don't know, you're not getting our information, that the Community Investment Act was established in 2005 and it um, 
it is funded through a surcharge at the local level on recording fees. The money goes up. It funds four programs, the Open Space Grant Program, Farmland Preservation, Affordable Housing Development, and Historic Properties Preservation. It has been wildly successful, but it also has been targeted year after year for rating to help offset budget deficits. So that program has got to be supported. And I will credit our legislators. They worked so hard in this past session to support the Community Investment Act. And it wasn't until the very, very end that $5 million was taken for the next two years out of that fund total, which is actually a, a victory compared to the previous two years where 50% had been cut for the two years, which, which really left the agency scrambling for some money. We also have two other programs, the Reckon Natural Heritage Trust Program, which is DEEP's source of funding. That program has been out of money, and DEEP has a list of properties where landowners would like to see their land conserved, but they have not been able to do that because they were out of money. That was recently funded by the Bond Commission, so hopefully DEEP will be able to then again move forward with all the work that they have been doing to try and conserve land. And finally, the Recreation Trails and Greenways Program, which Eric will talk about, but that also does fund some acquisition. Finally, here's something new, which is kind of nice to talk about, and that is, it, it's new and it's not. For years, we have been trying to get in place a municipal funding option that would enable but not require towns to establish a open space fund for stewardship and acquisition. It would be funded through a buyer's conveyance fee. It's, I, I don't know how many years through different iterations that bill has been tried and has not made it anywhere. This year, what we are trying to do is get a bill passed for the same purpose, but it would only include towns that want to be placed in the bill. It's enabling, even if those towns are in the bill, they don't have to do anything, but they're in there and they have the right to move forward and decide on a community by community basis if they want to establish that program. Previous iterations have been attempting to establish this statewide and it hasn't gone anywhere. So we're really, really hoping that you can reach out to your local CEO, your mayor, your first selectman, and ask them if they'd be interested in, in presenting this option to their town. And if so, contact us, and we can work with their legislators to have that town named in the bill. Okay. There's more to talk thank about, you. but I'm done. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> um, let's hear it for creativity. Uh, Karen. Uh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Breathless. Yeah. What an act to follow. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. You've heard in the previous panel about the state water plan, and it is a living, breathing document that still has work to be done, but it lays the basis for uh, balancing the use of water for all the various needs and for pr protecting uh, water quantity and water quality, amongst other things. But there's one issue in the state water plan that will be the basis for what I'm going to say this morning, and that is protecting watershed land. It pr promotes the protection of watershed land. And protecting watershed land uh, results not only in environmental benefits, but economic benefits and quality of life benefits. Oh, move. Uh, ah. Is this better? Oh, ah, yeah. oh, I don't want to say, but protecting watershed land, that is what I'm here to talk about this morning. And protecting watershed land not only has environmental benefits to people, but it has economic and it has quality of life. Um, this same sentiment, and Amy mentioned the green plan, was included in the DEEP's green plan that was released this year because the plan includes as one of its four major priorities the acquisition of land that will protect our natural waters and drinking water resources. So you, you've heard that not, not much has been done, but with this being said, and people might ask the question, if land experts and stakeholders and water experts and stakeholders all believe that it's important to protect watershed land. What's the problem? You know, why am I here talking about it? Well, uh, the Green Plan also states that Connecticut has witnessed a rapid growth in developed land compared to the rate of population growth over the last 40 years. We've seen a lot of land developed at the same time, there's been a slow growth in population, and many people might refer to that uh, land development uh, pattern as sprawl. The Green Plan also states that between 1985 and 2010, the state lost 115,200 acres of forest land. This fact, along with the high rate of development, is important because developed land can't provide the same, and they call it, sustaining ecosystem services that natural lands do. Developed land and watershed land can't, doesn't protect and can often harm our drinking water sources. It is a widely uh, accepted fact that source water protection through land protection of the watershed land is a cornerstone of the multi-barrier approach to safe drinking water. This multi-barrier approach is needed to protect drinking water from contaminants. 
Protecting the land helps ensure that the water will not be threatened by pollution from roads, sewers, or urban runoff. And these core forest areas, of which the Green Plan says we've already lost 100,000 acres, um, is, is, noted to, is, is known to help and promote water infiltration. This uh, watershed land protection that not only protects our water quality, it is an investment that pays off through reduced water treatment rates. Uh, one figure from a Trust for Public Land report states that for every 10% increase in forest cover in source water area, treatment and chemical costs, costs decrease by approximately 20%. So this protection of water and the reduction in treatment cost helps now, but it also helps provide a safe water supply for generations to come. Let me just give you a few statistics, and I'm going to read these also, and they come from the Green Plan. Um, the Green Plan states that there are over 550,000 acres of watershed land in Connecticut. Of this number, about a third is owned by water companies, the state, and, and or municipalities. Approximately 20% of the watershed land is already developed, and that leaves 47% privately owned and undeveloped. Some of this undeveloped watershed land is currently available for development, and land around reservoirs and water bodies is particularly attractive to developers. There's a, a, a sheet in your packet from uh, Connecticut Fund for the Environment that lists, and you can get an idea where the drinking water watersheds are. The green plan also is, is in a positive note, and, and all the acreage that it wants, to, if it wants to preserve, and it would like to, in the next five years, it would like to uh, preserve 1,500 acres of uh, watershed land and have municipalities and land trusts and other partners acquire 3,000, 3,500 acres. And this is the land around reservoirs, streams, groundwater sources, and that's a really good thing if it would happen. Um, the preservation of watershed land um, protects our water sources and our natural resources, and both of those things are essential to the health and the quality of life in our state. To me, the watershed land protection is a, is a no-brainer, uh, but there is a catch. Uh, we have to be continually vigilant about what's going on. If you have a chance, if you have the opportunity to look in your packet, there is a handout from Protect Our Watershed Connecticut. This group was formed in 2016 to protect and preserve drinking water for all Connecticut residents and has focused critical attention on the legislation that would exempt the city of New Britain from current environmental laws protecting class one and class two watershed land by allowing the city of New Britain to lease over 130 acres of New Britain Water Company land to Tilcon, a private company for the purpose of extracting stone and other materials. Thanks to the effort of this group, other residents, environmental groups who lobbied and sent information to legislators, this uh, legislation was changed to require the city to commission a study on the environmental impacts of this proposed change in use. Um, that would have that would allow a mining operation. Um, the end result of this change of use would be within 40 to 50 years a water reservoir on the quarry site. And the results of the study are due out next week and will be reviewed by the Council on Environmental Quality, the Water Planning Council, the Watershed Land Group, which we know, and. Um, and many advocates. And by the way, if you're not aware, Connecticut has some of the strongest protections for um, the forests and land that surround drinking water watersheds, uh, watershed areas and water reservoirs that help uh, filter the water, and that's the way we want to keep it. Um, if this change, oh, can I just say one? I just would like to point out someone. If this change has occurred, it will have a long-lasting effect on New Britain, its residents, the area. And Paul Zagorski, is here in the audience. He is the founding, uh, one of the founding members of Protect uh, the Watershed Group, and he will be around through lunch to answer any questions you may have. Sweet, thank you. Eric. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Eric. So uh, my name is Eric Hammerling. I'm, I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. And, and when I think about land conservation, I tend to think about it in, in three different buckets. Uh, one is you need to have enough funding to acquire lands. And other is you need to have the resources to manage those lands. And then in particular, when you're thinking about public lands, uh, and class one and two watershed lands, you need to have a process that ensures that those lands are 
safe and aren't given away. Uh, so I'll be talking about a, a two issues in the uh, resources to manage lands category and one in trying to protect those lands from being given away. Uh, one of those uh, programs that's really important but right now is out of funding is the state's uh, Connecticut uh, Recreational Trails and Greenways program. Now, uh, many of you know that when you go outdoors and want to ex experience uh, all the, the amazing diversity that we have in Connecticut, one of the, the best ways to do that is on trails. Um, and Connecticut, uh, for many years, has been a leader in trails. Uh, in fact, uh, for those of you who every June, the first weekend in June, participate in Connecticut Trails Day, you'll be proud to know that there are more Trails Day events that happen in Connecticut than any other state in the nation. Why is that? Because the, we have so many land trusts, so, so many watershed groups, uh, so many uh, advocates who love land, uh, municipalities who understand how important those lands are uh, to public, public health and recreation. And in fact, um, the Outdoor uh, Recreation and Industry Association um, did a recent study on the uh, economic benefits uh, of those lands. And I'll, I'll just read that uh, very quickly. Uh, outdoor recreation generates $6.9 billion uh, in Connecticut in consumer spending, $2.2 billion in wages and salaries in the private sector, $502 million in state and local uh, tax revenues, and supports 71,000 Connecticut jobs. So uh, it, it is really uh, important to ensure that there's a program like Recreational Trails and Greenways to support all of that economic activity, all of the public health that comes from using trails. And to, to add just one last thing on that, um, every, every five years, uh, Connecticut does this really important report uh, called SCORP. Uh, it's the State Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. The number one uh, activity that people in Connecticut participate in is walking on trails. Uh, so we need to have a program that supports that. Uh, I, I also want to thank the legislators who are here today, uh, particularly those who took a great interest uh, this last session in making sure there is a passport to parks. Uh, those of you who've heard of the Passport to, the, to Parks know that it's a, a program that took effect, uh, you know, January this year to actually allow all of us to get into parks for free. Uh, in return, we all will be uh, contributing to this program through our uh, vehicle registration. It's a $10 fee that we all pay every other year, but that generates enough resources uh, to help parks uh, be maintained and, in fact, those campgrounds that have been closed for the last two years uh, should be able to be reopened. Uh, and I, I'd imagine that Commissioner Klee will talk some more about this. But uh, again, thanks to the legislators who helped uh, make sure there is a passport to parks uh, and ongoing support uh, for our uh, state jewels. Uh, and, and then lastly, uh, I want to talk about this really important issue that many people don't know about, and that is uh, your state parks and forests and wildlife management areas, for the most part, uh, are not actually protected. Uh, now, you might look at me a, a little bit strangely and say, wait a second, uh, it's a state park, it's a state forest, how can it not be protected? Well, every year, there's a process uh, in the General Assembly uh, known as the Conveyance Act. Uh, in the Conveyance Act, uh, legislators have the ability to nominate different uh, state lands to be sold, swapped, or given away. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Haddam land swap, uh, which was uh, one of the ways that, you know, that issue really came to great public attention. But of course, for many years, this has been uh, done. I would say that in the Conveyance Act that happens every year, probably, uh, you know, three quarters of the things in the Conveyance Act are not controversial. But for that one quarter um, of public lands, valuable public lands that are proposed to be given away, uh, that is something that we're very concerned about. And what we're most concerned about is that the current process uh, has kind of two steps. One is there's a public hearing. Um, however, uh, it, it is you know, fairly regular that after a public hearing, there are additional things added to the conveyance bill, additional public lands uh, that are given away, and there's no opportunity for public input. 
So there's a, a bill that was passed in 2016 uh, that would amend the state constitution if it's passed again it, and gets on the ballot this November, uh, which would essentially require three things. It would, it would require a public hearing before public lands could be given away, a two-thirds vote uh, in each chamber before lands could be given away, um, and uh, individual bills for those lands that are being proposed uh, to be given away, which is something that uh, you know has been a, a process issue in the past when you have an omnibus bill with all these things together. Uh, as I mentioned, many of them non-controversial. Those carry along the controversial uh, proposals along with them if we're not careful. So I, I will stop there and we look forward to your questions. All right, awesome, thank you. Um, Okay, and let's, um, what is your opinion regarding the use of open space land for green energy? <laughs> oh, I don't know why they're looking at me, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, well, okay, so, so this is, it's a very good question because, you know, obviously uh, this is a land conservation panel, but we also support uh, renewable energy. We want to see uh, that be a part of the state's energy mix. Um, and uh, the thing that is most concerning to, to me, and I won't speak for my, my co-panelists, um, is when we have incentives, incentives for renewable energy that actually promote the loss of forest land, uh, agricultural land, uh, more than other types of uh, lands uh, that, that we're trying to protect on the land conservation side. Um, there are a, a lot of new ideas that are always coming up in this area about uh, both renewable energy technologies that are less um, uh, intensive on the land and can be compatible with uh, land conservation. Um, and I think the legislature you know, tried to find that middle ground this last year uh, in some legislation that uh, makes sure that the siting council is taking into consideration core forest land and agricultural land uh, before permitting uh, renewable energy projects. So it's a, it's a balancing act, but one that I think will eventually find the right balance. Thank you. Is there a large scale plan uh, for connectivity of natural areas? And if not, is there something in the works? Um, I would say that um, when you say a large scale plan, um, certainly we are moving towards a lot of regional work. We have regional conservation partnerships throughout the state now that are working um, with the land trusts within their communities and the communities themselves in terms of getting the mapping done and then looking at um, the ways that the natural resources can be connected within the region. Um, it's really interesting to go through the exercise of looking at one of those maps and then removing the data layer that shows the town boundaries and then all you see is the connectivity and I think that we are definitely moving in the right direction when it comes to, the, to, to that effort and I think as Eric alluded to I mean one of the ways that we can really support that is to support the state program through DEEP um, to help with greenways and um, recreational trails because that's a very obvious way that we can promote connectivity um, with public access. Great, and then follow-up question, are there opportunities for towns to collaborate in conservation? For example, a city paying a rural town to conserve more land? Wow. Can you repeat that question? Imagine that. <laughs> are there opportunities right? for intermunicipal collaboration? And the example was given, you know, a city wants to see land conservation but doesn't really have it within its boundaries, paying, paying a rural community and, and some kind of credit mechanism. Well, I, I, I was going to say, I, I don't know of that many uh, incentives that are there other than um, limited budgets, uh, reality, the, the fact that uh, there are resources that um, can be used more efficiently on a regional basis, likely. Um, and, uh, and we are seeing in those communities where it makes sense to find uh, you know, innovative ways to partner, those partnerships are starting to happen. But, but then again, uh, you know, it, this, uh, we're, we're in Connecticut. This is a home rule state. Uh, every town tends to think about itself uh, somewhat individually. And, and it's, uh, though it is important for us to be thinking broader, uh, I wish we had something known as counties uh, in Connecticut. Um, I, you know, I, I think that's a direction we need to move in. 
but it's not where we are right now. And, and I would just add again, just to follow up on my previous response, that the Regional Conservation Partnership Network that's really developing is helping to foster those opportunities for towns to, to be in the same room together. CLCC offers these summits and, and land trusts and towns just come and talk to each other. And it's been, it's been very helpful because they're seeing more commonalities, commonalities than not and are, especially in light of limited resources, are really seeing the efficiencies of working together. So I think we are moving in the right direction that way, um, and I look forward to coming back in a couple of years and reporting on where we're at. And we probably will have fewer land trusts, which is not a bad thing, it's probably a good thing, because a lot of these smaller land trusts are, are, are looking at ways of working together to be, more, to be more effective in the long term. And I should have added, too, that there are some regional conservation partnerships that have kind of sprung up around the state, around different habitats and opportunities to look at things on a broader basis, and I think those are helping to imprint uh, you know, the opportunities to think broader, and, and that's a good thing. Great, and then last question, Tilcon, anybody want to make any predictions? A simple no. Well, well, <laughs> um, I, I think that the, I, I think when people look at at this whole proposal, when you are taking, the, the 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 bottom line is what is the actual benefit for water, and to the not only the residents of the city and surrounding communities over the long run, and I think that uh, when this Tilcon report comes out, it will be scrutinized. It will be scrutinized not only by public agencies, but by um, the legislators. The legislature had turned down a proposal similar to this in 2007, and my hope is that um, uh, if that that the same will be turned down again. I, I for what we have seen and what we have heard, we don't have not seen the long-term benefits of this, only the uh, detrimental effects to the community. But we'll okay. have to wait and see. Thank you. All right. Thank you, land panel. So the land panel scoops. And the next presenters, thank you very much. Great job. Hi, I'm Brenda Watson. I'm the Acting Director of Operation Fuel. And I'm here today uh, because I'm really interested in hearing all the varying opinions, uh, professional opinions, on where Connecticut is going to go um, in 2018 and beyond in terms of our energy uh, policy and environmental policy, as well as uh, water policy in the state. Hello, I'm Dr. Gail Ridge. I'm Legislative Chair of the uh, 350CT. Um, we have written a bill in conjunction with the Sierra Club um, addressing uh, extensive gas leaks in Connecticut. A study done in 2016 it can in fact flag leaks along Main Street in Hartford and you can see this from two or three miles at, uh, above the surface of the city where each leak is. Um, the total loss, just in a brief study of five weeks, 
uh, discovered over 215 homes a day in the centre of Hartford losing gas. That's an equivalent of over $330,000 of lost revenue that could be used by the state. And this is just the beginning. This law will address this issue throughout the state. Um, and we are very much appreciative of your support. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here again this year uh, with you. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, thank you to the members of the General Assembly who are here. Uh, thank you to my uh, members of my deep staff, my amazing deep staff who are here. And really thank you to all of the, the advocates here in this room who are fighting hard on the front lines each and every day. Um, it seems like only yesterday that the 2017 legislative session ended, perhaps because it did only end yesterday. Um, or actually they're not quite done, there's still a $250 million deficit. Um, there were some wins in the past session and uh, Eric alluded to one of them. Um, and I wanted to talk about that with the help of so many people in this room. Um, the Passport to Parks was created. This is a sustainable funding source for our state parks. Um, we must always be vigilant, however, to additional sweeps of these funds to pay for other things. They were even built in to the creation of the Passport, but I am gonna try to be positive uh, today. Um, each year, more than nine million people visit our state parks, fun fact. That's more than the casinos combined. So we're a major driver of, of tourism here in this state. And with this new program, we can expect to see even more folks coming. We're actually um, gearing up for a 10% or so increase. This is an economic driver to the state, to the communities that they are located in. When people visit our state parks, they also visit the local restaurants. They shop, they go to a farm. They sometimes even go to a brewery. I've been known to do that on occasion myself. <laughs> So it's important that we continue to invest in and protect our parks and the new Passport to Parks program helps to provide that consistent funding stream to protect them. It also allows us to give more to the public and Eric was alluding to this, um, that has now invested, they're now invested in our park system so that um, we will be rolling out increased lifeguards, shoulder season camping for opening day of fishing and into the fall foliage season, longer hours our museums and nature centers. These are the things that the visitors and the public uh, want and they enjoy. We're also gonna focus on creating a positive visitor experience with a focus on safety, ensuring our parks are properly maintained, trash pickup, clean bathrooms. I'm a parent with kids, those are some of the most important things, but trail maintenance. That 10% increase in visitors, we're gonna be reaching out to them to help us in that mission, to be the backpacker, to pack in, um, pack it in, you have to pack it out or help us in keeping our parks clean and safe. We're also looking to, do a, it's a great source of seasonal employment. So if you know someone who's interested, we're, we're hiring, go to the Connecticut Jobs app, um, the jobscloud.com CT. We're looking for lifeguards, maintainers. We get an amazing crop of folks who are in the environmental field, who are passionate about these issues, who come and work. A lot of our full-time staff actually started um, as a ticket taker at Hammond Asset or, or the like in the seasonal program. So make no mistake, Passport to Parks was an important victory, um, but there were also setbacks. And that happened when the governor was out of the room. Though we killed it in the Environment Committee, somehow the budget bill included a requirement that certain permit requests submitted to DEEP shall be automatically deemed approved unless otherwise acted upon within 90 days. The 90-day permitting made it into the budget. This is awful public policy, period, full stop. And it's on the part of the General Assembly. It's one that we're gonna work to address. I'm gonna be very clear on this point. I will never put the health or safety of our residents or the environment of this state in jeopardy by automatic approval of permits. My staff. So my staff has been spending an inordinate amount of time trying to manage this new um, hidden law and it's wasted time to interpret it in a way that's least harmful to our environment and our citizens. I wasn't gonna talk about our declining budget, our shrinking staff, our loss of people with more than 30 years experience, because I've been told by folks that I depress the hell out of everyone when I go, when I start, I literally people have told me that it's, it's, it's a little too depressing. But 
This 90-day stupidity is really the type of things that just wastes our time for no good reason. And that's what I'm going to fight against as well with the General Assembly. Another obvious and misguided misstep of the General Assembly was sweeping a significant portion of the funding for our award-winning Green Bank and energy efficiency programs, as well as the sweeps of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative auction pro proceeds, all of which are investments in Connecticut's clean energy economy. These programs have been vital to our efforts to reduce carbon emissions and help customers lower their energy consumption. Efficiency is the first fuel, the foundation of our clean energy programs in Connecticut. The efficiency sector employs tens of thousands of people here in Connecticut as HES providers, HVAC installers, insulation installers, right here in Connecticut. Efficiency and weatherization reduces energy burden on low and moderate income households. Efficiency helps businesses large and small stay competitive here in Connecticut. And efficiency avoids us having to build new or run old fossil fuel power plants in the New England grid when we get credit for the ISO New England in their forward capacity auction. The Connecticut Green Bank, with Brian Garcia is going to talk more about right after me, has sparked a clean energy revolution in this state and was a national, international movement of green banks. And were some of the reasons it won the Harvard Kennedy School's Innovation and in Government Award in 2017. The green bank model is using limited public dollars to leverage five, six, ten times the amount of private capital and is responsible for a billion dollars invested in our clean energy economy. The Green Bank has supported residential solar investments through a Shrek program helped foster thousands of solar jobs here in Connecticut. The Green Bank has reduced energy costs and deployed clean energy in the commercial, industrial, manufacturing, and nonprofit sectors through its remarkable CPACE program. The Green Bank has tackled the tough sectors, the multifamily, the low and moderate income, to ensure that the clean energy revolution includes all of Connecticut. Despite the legislature's goal of no new taxes, customers will be continued to charge will continue to be charged for these programs on their utility bills, and the money will flow to the general fund, effectively creating an energy tax on all of us. So we're working closely with the Green Bank and the Energy Efficiency Board, the clean energy companies, and advocates to mitigate the damage caused by the sweeps and secure the future of the vital of these vital programs. Despite those difficulties that the last session brought, I'm actually hopeful that the upcoming legislative session will, the legislators will commit themselves to protecting the future and not on just the budgetary side, but take real action to address climate change. And yes, I'm a commissioner who can talk openly about climate change. I'm actually can talk about it. I'm actually allowed to do something about it. We're a rare breed. It's a dozen or so <laughs> across the country. I'm not joking. It's, it's growing slowly. The numbers are growing. Governor Malloy will continue to take a leadership role in the face of the awful combination of federal denial, retreat, inaction, and outright assault on our environment that have been perpetrated by the Trump administration. <laughs> So I want to spend the remainder of my time, and I know they're telling me my, my time is short, but you guys are running early. We're not even at 1030 yet, so I'm going to take a few more minutes. Thank you. Um, all of us should feel an obligation to future generations to take action to address the very real threat of climate change. So I'm going to talk about why I believe now is the time in this upcoming legislative session to prioritize climate change by both, one, integrating our climate and energy policies, and two, finding ways to adapt to our already changed climate and make our communities more resilient in the face of projected sea level rise. So in his farewell address, President Obama was clear on this point. He's a president I can actually freely quote without worrying that he's going to say potty words that my seven-year-old shouldn't be hearing, so I will quote him freely. Uh, without bolder action, our children won't have the time to debate the existence of climate change, they will be busy dealing with its effects. Environmental disasters, economic disruptions, and waves of climate refugees seeking sanctuary. Now, we can and should debate about the best approach to this problem, but to simply deny the problem not only betrays future generations, it betrays the essential spirit of innovation and practical problem solving that guided our founders. Innovation and problem solving, that is at the core of what truly makes America great. What makes this past year's assault on science and innovation so disturbing as well. It's particularly odd here to be a scientist, and I am one. I am a scientist. I'm also the son of a scientist. My dad was a biomedical engineer. I'm the grandson of a scientist. He was a food chemist. I married a scientist. She's a psychologist. <laughs> My kids love science, and they love going out in the natural world. 
And I have the honor and privilege of leading an agency with over 500 scientists and engineers. Our agency scientists, in partnership with our great academic institutions here in Connecticut, have created the 30 year plus year record of changes to the temperature, water quality, sea level, and flora and fauna on Long Island Sound. This time series data shows warmer waters, rising waters, and waters that now more closely resemble Maryland than Maine. It's blue crabs instead of lobsters in Long Island Sound, as the cold water species move north and the warm water species move in. And here in this audience, there are citizen scientists, all of you here, who have observed that that part of town that now floods every week or every month that never used to flood before, or the disruptive rhythms of the seasons where birds or bugs arrive early, some arrive too late, or some don't arrive at all. The scientific predictions of the likely new normal under a warm climate all seem to happen this year in dramatic fashion. The torrential rains and floods of Houston, the hurricane that devastated and is still devastating Puerto Rico, the fires of California, the dramatic loss of life and the incredible billions of dollars of damage to our infrastructure and our cities and our communities. So here in Connecticut, actual scientists, we have them here in Connecticut, we actually listen to them as well, <laughs> at the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation, CERCA, supported by DEEP and the Connecticut General Assembly, have now localized the national and global projection for sea level rise to our conditions on the ground here in Connecticut, and they've established that we should expect 50 centimeters of sea level rise in Long Island Sound by 2050. 50 by 50, that's one foot eight inches, 20 inches for all those who want to do the conversion. And I'll let that sink in because that will have a dramatic impact on our state and the infrastructure along our coastline. We need strong and smart policies governing the decisions we are making in the coastal zone, which will be a dramatically different place over the next 30 years with increased frequency of flooding events and higher flood levels. President Trump's misguided decision to withdraw from the Paris Agreement only increases the probability of the more storms in the future and that our sea level rise projections will be too low. Thankfully, Connecticut has stepped up and joined with other states, Republican and Democratic, in forming the United States Climate Alliance, which is committing to holding the Paris Climate Agreement and taking aggressive action on climate change. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt has also announced his plans to roll back the Clean Power Plan. That made I had to go travel to West Virginia to tell them, hell no, that's not what we want here in Connecticut. I had to go to the heart of coal country, the only public hearing he was holding on the matter until enough people got up and yelled and he's finally holding a few more. The morning of that first day was what Pruitt wanted. The CEO of Murray Energy falsely claimed that the clean power plan was killing coal jobs instead of the changes in the natural gas markets that were actually the cause of its demise. And he had 50 of his employees behind him in their jumpsuits and hard hats to say that they're killing coal jobs. That was the first hour or so of that hearing, but then the rest of it and the two days of it, and when, when I was there, something inspiring happened people from across the country got on buses and cars and planes and made that trip to Charleston, West Virginia, which is not an easy trip, to share their stories of about how coal-fired power plants and the air pollution that they create are impacting their communities, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers, their cousins. These were high school and college kids. These were environmental justice activists. These were concerned individuals, all coming to say, we don't, there is a different way, there is a better way, and more coal is not the answer. So it's easy to get down in the face of uh, the bad policies come out of Washington, but those voices in Charleston were inspiring and uplifting, and I was proud to join them. We need to harness similar and channel similar inspiring and uplifting voices here in Connecticut to take action against climate change. One of those inspiring voices came last Friday from the Governor's Council on Climate Change, and I know there are members here who are part of that organization. It's a group of state agencies, nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, business leaders, who through consensus recommended an economy-wide greenhouse gas emission reduction target of 45% below 2001 levels by 2030. Forty-five percent by 2030 is an ambitious goal that will require significant and dramatic changes to all sectors of our state's economy and a concerted effort by all parts of civil society. And to put that in some context, it's California or New York plus. California, they're at 40 percent by 2030. New York is at 40 percent by 2030. Rhode Island is at 45 percent by 2035, so five years ahead of Rhode Island. This is where the statement that we're going to make here in Connecticut relative to our peers, but we picked the linear 
projection, the linear projection from where we are today to that 80% by 2050 goal that's in statute. So that just keeps us on target. But there's a whole lot we have to do. We must implement a major transformation of how we generate energy in a short and use energy in a short amount of time. We must commit to modernizing and decarbonizing our transportation system, vehicles, building stock, heating, cooling systems, electricity generation system. There will be inevitably be multiple options and choices for achieving greenhouse gas reductions, so we must prioritize measures based on their ability to deliver the most bang for the buck. We should focus on the things that are most cost effective and efficient, and we should focus on proven scalable technologies. We should recognize the code benefits, improved health, economic development, energy security and independence and quality of life. The success of our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Connecticut and its value to the national and international efforts to limit global temperatures below two degrees Celsius requires engagement and action from all levels of government, local, state, regional and national. Government action alone cannot do it. We must harness the innovation and engage and foster and leverage the support, the support of the private sector as it develops and implements solutions that will lead to greenhouse gas reductions. The government and private sectors can't do it by themselves. Individual citizens, civic organizations, religious groups, NGOs, and other members of civil society must be engaged, active participants in a transition to a decarbonized economy. Fairness, justice, and equity, and intergenerational costs must be a part of that discussion about climate change. We must maximize synergies between the things we're doing to reduce emissions and the things we're doing to adapt to climate change. And we must regularly check in to make sure that we're on the right path. So we know that Connecticut cannot solve the global climate crisis on its own. Our emissions are a fraction of a fraction of the, the global emissions. But we know that Connecticut can implement innovative, thoughtful, progressive mitigation and adaptation policies that will dramatically reduce our emissions, grow our economy, and make our communities more resilient. In doing so, we continue to light a path for others to follow. This is our mission, leaving our planet in better shape than we found it for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. Working together, I think we can do this and achieve real change this legislative session, and I'm asking your support in this endeavor. Thank you. A stretch. Okay, thank you. That was great, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you for lifting us up. We need that. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Lee, Claire, Lori, Melissa, uh, the CFE team, the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters, uh, for pulling together this pre session environmental forum today and inviting the Connecticut Green Bank to be a part of it to say a few words. When you approached me about speaking at this forum, uh, you asked that I provide an update on the recent sweeps of the Connecticut Green Bank and the impact those sweeps have had on us and our outlook on the future of clean energy in Connecticut. As hard as it is to discuss those sweeps, and given the challenges in front of our legislative leaders to fix a long-term structural budget deficit problem, I will attempt to communicate a message in a way that is hopeful. Hopeful because it would seem that every day, when we open up the paper or when we jump online to read the news, there is another article that puts us in a place of hopelessness. So I wanted to start off by telling you a story. Try it like this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll use my hands, great. So I wanted to start off by telling you a story. That's much better. Uh, two weeks ago, I was at an event in New Britain, hosted by the Daughters of Mary of the Immaculate Conception, to witness the power of green energy. The Connecticut Green Bank, working with our partners at Eversource Energy and EcoSolar, invested $2.8 million in a 1.2 megawatt, five-part solar array project on their campus. This project will save the Daughters of Mary $1.3 million over the next 20 years and reduce the emissions that cause global climate change. This is how we speak about green energy. 
investment, deployment, reducing energy costs, and confronting climate change. What I learned that day was more important about this project than the numbers is that we innovate to transform people's lives. Because of the energy savings that green energy provides to the Daughters of Mary, they are able to improve the services they offer to house the poor, help the battered, and provide daycare services for the young and old. As the state of Connecticut faces budget challenges and how it is going to maintain important services within our communities to help those in need, it is green energy that is providing a gateway to inclusive prosperity in our communities. We are not faced with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather one complex crisis which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. Since the inception of the Connecticut Green Bank in July of 2011, we have delivered extraordinary results for Connecticut. We've mobilized over a billion dollars of private investment in our green economy by leveraging ratepayer funds for the last couple of years by eight to one, meaning for every $1 million of ratepayer resources invested, we attract $8 million of private investment into our state. We have helped more than 25,000 families and businesses lower the burden of energy costs by deploying green energy. The savings that those families and businesses receive from green energy will improve their lives and their bottom line. In 2014, we took a hard look at the impact we were making with green energy in low to moderate income communities. The findings were striking. Even though we were successful mobilizing private investment into our state's economy, we were failing to ensure that green energy was available to everyone. For example, in 2012, we invested $2 million in 70 projects for low to moderate income households. Last year, we invested over $80 million in more than 3,500 projects in low to moderate income households. That is 40 times more investment and 50 times more projects. For the first time ever in the six years of the Connecticut Green Bank, low to moderate income families were receiving more investment in green energy than non-low to moderate income families. There can be no renewal of our relationship with nature without a renewal of humanity itself. There can be no ecology without an adequate anthropology. In the process of bringing green energy to families and businesses, we have created more than 13,000 jobs in our communities through contractors who are at the front lines of the green economy. These are jobs that our state desperately needs. We have deployed more than 230 megawatts of green energy that will reduce 3.7 million metric tons of greenhouse gases that will help us confront global climate change. The model of the Connecticut Green Bank is now being replicated across this country and around the world. In New York, New Jersey, Nevada, Montgomery County, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., to South Africa, India, and Latin America. Because of the audacity of our political leaders to work in a bipartisan way to create the Connecticut Green Bank in July of 2011, the state of Connecticut and the Connecticut Green Bank last year won the coveted Innovations in American Government Awards from the Kennedy School at Harvard University. <laughs> this is the Oscars of public service recognition. Then on October 31st last year, a bipartisan budget was passed that swept $175 million of ratepayer and reggie funds to help reduce the budget deficit of the general fund of the state of Connecticut. $32.6 million was swept from the Connecticut Green Bank, more than 55% of our resources. Believe me, that hurts, that sweet hurt, the sweep hurt. Yes, we have taken significant steps to address the acute impacts of those sweeps on the organization by reducing operating expenses, displacing staff, canceling investments, and restructuring ourselves to pursue a strategy of sustainability while maintaining our mission and purpose and commitment to the underserved. Thanks in large part 
to the leadership of Commissioner Klee and Deep. However, it is the chronic impacts that we now need to address. As a result of the sweeps, we lost a deal that was the foundation to our future, a future without the need for ratepayer or public funds to advance our green economy. The deal was with one of the largest commercial banks in the country. Because of the strength of our balance sheet and because of our track record of delivering measurable results, they wanted to provide us a $10 million loan at a 1% interest rate for a 10-year term. Let me tell you that it doesn't get any better than that. That $10 million deal, all private funds, would have attracted another $30 million of private investment on top of that for $40 million that was going towards green energy in underserved markets of low to moderate income families and small businesses. We lost the deal because of the sweeps and are now working hard to restore the confidence from private investors that the state of Connecticut and the Connecticut Green Bank are still places they should be investing in. And this leads me to my final point bringing us back to innovation, leadership, and hope. I want to tell one last story about a conversation I had after the sweeps with a prominent economic development leader in our state. So I'm going to ask a question. Has anyone here heard of the Madden curse? All right. <laughs> I don't know why. We can talk afterwards. Um, as someone who grew up playing Madden football on PlayStation, and beings that I've become a big fan of the New England Patriots, go Pats, we've got the Super Bowl coming up in a couple of weeks, I'm quite familiar with the Madden curse. The Madden curse goes something like this. Since 1998, most NFL players who have selected to grace the cover of Madden football, and there have been 19 of them, have had troubling or abruptly shortened seasons following their cover debut. This year, who was on the cover? Tom Brady. All right, so we're going to defy all odds. He's the GOAT after all. At the end of the conversation I was in with this leader, he asked me, was it worth it to be on the cover of Madden? I knew immediately what he meant. What he meant was that because we won the most prestigious award in government, this put a target on our backs for the sweeps that would subsequently occur. The point he was trying to make was that because of the innovation and leadership we were being recognized for, this made us susceptible for the legislature to sweep us because of the positive press we were receiving. Our state has challenges ahead in dealing with the budget deficit. You can't read an article without feeling despair. In order for us to lift ourselves out of this problem, we need optimism. We need positive examples. We need to feel that there is a pathway forward. We need to believe that there is a gateway to inclusive prosperity. So let us sing as we go. May our struggles and our concern for this planet never take away the joy of our hope. Thank you. Thank you both very much for the content and the like standing up there with leadership and getting everybody I think really pretty pumped. Um, so we've done good with timing and I'm going to grab the basket of, okay, thank you. Um, what are sweeps? <laughs> They are the taking of money from one place by legislative decision uh, from where it is supposed to go into the general budget. Good enough? Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to just grab the basket of questions which I have left in the back. Okay. Looking smooth. Um, is Connecticut falling behind neighboring states in residential solar, shared solar? Do we have catch up to do? So let, let me tackle residential solar. And I yeah, see and my, I think, I my, yeah, I maybe each of you can here. comment. Um, so, so I took a look at the, I think, Acadia Center story this morning that Jan Ellen Spiegel ran in the Connecticut Mirror. I took a quick look at it. There was one section that compared on a 
per capita basis the deployment of behind the meter renewable energy. That's all behind the meter, commercial, industrial, uh, residential. I know that our residential program on a watts per capita basis is leading right alongside Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. So um, I feel really good about where Connecticut is on residential solar. Uh, but more importantly, when you look at the dollars we expend in public subsidies per watt deployed, we are dramatically less than those neighboring states, which means we are doing it in a smarter way and we're doing it in a way that's attracting more private capital. Um, I anticipate there's going to be questions on the, the Chinese tariff. I'll throw out a few, a few uh, data points in terms of Connecticut. So over the course of the last five years, we've had $725 million of investment going into the residential solar market. Uh, 100 million of that is going to Chinese panels. Uh, if you look at uh, our projects, 60% of the projects come from uh, China uh, in terms of panels. Um, in the conversations we've had with contractors and in terms of looking at the impacts of the tariff on residential solar, it's going to be something like 10 to 15 cents per watt, which is about 3%. So we feel good about where Connecticut is uh, with regards to dealing with the tariff. Now, uh, with regards to commercial and industrial and, and, and uh, uh, utility scale systems, those are going to be more impacted by those economics. But on the residential side, we feel uh, like we can weather. Uh, the tariffs. And so I'll, I'll only add to that that our goal uh, with the final draft of the energy strategy, Mary Sotos is in the back, which will be coming out soon, is to make sure that there's a sustainable glide path to take what the Green Bank has done in terms of residential solar, their SHREC program, and make sure that glide path continues and maintains the robust um, clean energy industry that has been developed here. So we have taken your feedback to heart during the draft to final process. So I think you'll be um, uh, pleasantly, uh, um, you'll be, uh, I think, appreciative of the, the moves that we're making in that direction to ensure that there's a sustainable long-term funding as that is a, a key for us um, and a key to keep building on the fact that Connecticut is a leader in making sure that we're being the most frugal that we can in the deployment um, of our limited, very limited state resources and really finding ways to deploy at, at scale, um, leveraging private capital wherever we can. On shared solar as well, so we've also heard you there, um, that is a place where we're uh, in, the, in the revised CES, um, that it will be a pathway to a statewide wide program. I will caution though that I don't know if you want to cheer for me yet, because you didn't hear my caution, that one of the, the places that we're most interested in shared solar is to the extent that it can help reduce energy burden on low and moderate income folks and small businesses. Because we think that's the, the true benefit of those savings are to those segments of our economy that, that need them most. But that will be part again of the, the reform of, of the behind the meter programs to ensure that there's there's a, a, a robust place for that and for our municipal folks, for our municipal and, and ag and, and, uh, and state sort of behind the meter programs as well. So those are all elements uh, of the, how to find that sustainable path to ensure we're um, supporting our in-state and behind the meter solar programs. Okay, so I have a cluster of questions about energy policy and um, kind of different focal points. Um, see how methane emissions have up to 100 times the greenhouse effect of carbon emissions. Should we be implementing similar measures to a carbon tax, such as a methane tax or something? What, are we, what can we do about methane? So on, on methane in, in general, Connecticut is one of the leading states in trying to address leaky, you know, the old. We are states with old infrastructure, leaky pipes, those sorts of things. Um, on the, the subject of a, of a methane tax or carbon tax uh, in general, um, obviously I'm a, I'm a former academic, the, you know, and the, um, the taxation system is one of the more efficient ways to get at this sort of problem, but I'm also... A, a realist and I live in the real world and with this General Assembly I don't see that happening by any stretch of the imagination. And my data points there also come from the fact that in the energy strategy we proposed a modest fee on oil customers, propane customers, to have them contribute to our efficiency programs that was resoundly um, uh, Resoundly, it, it got a whole lot of folks upset at us and no one really supporting us on that front either. So. Um, 
taxation systems also will run into the problem of one state acting alone or out in front. And I know Representative Albus, I'm sure, is going to, he brought a bill in last year. I'm sure he'll bring another one back. These are issues on the taxation front, particularly when you're talking about fuels, uh, delivered fuels, that need coordination across multiple states. And that's why we're participating with the Georgetown Climate Center and the Transportation Climate Initiative to bring together those states to find a market-based mechanism that actually works. But taxation systems in the face of this, where we are with the General Assembly and the fact that you might, um, taxation systems that create other pots of money that will go to places that aren't investments in clean energy, I'm not sure that's the place we want to even go. I guess what I would add is on the project side, uh, working with DEEP uh, in the market, uh, we have our, our first food waste to energy project in Southington, Connecticut, the quantum biopower project that's taken food waste, um, producing methane, turning it into usable electricity and waste heat. Um, DEEP currently has an open RFP out looking for more um, anaerobic digestion projects. Um, we recently supported, literally going directly to the methane, um, the support of a loan guarantee on the farmer's cow uh, facility uh, to create anaerobic digestion from cow manure. Um, so literally we are trying to uh, find ways of reducing the global warming impact of methane from cows uh, by supporting local farmers in uh, former farmer's cow. Great, thank you. And so the next question is methane from natural gas infrastructure and expansion of natural gas infrastructure and why we are where we are, how can we um, manage, reduce, deal with that impact? Uh, the, the impacts in terms of leaks from, from pipelines or leaks at the... the cumulative power plants, cumulative impacts of natural gas and especially the expansion of natural gas infrastructure, I think is the question. So the, the expansions of natural gas infrastructure have basically on the, the ex expansion of pipelines into the region have basically been stopped by the fact that there isn't a multi-state uh, consensus and or movement to, to get them built. Without Massachusetts and it was 50% of our load, they don't get built. Um, our limited increase uh, in our natural gas capacity here in Connecticut were for fuel conversions, which have helped our manufacturing uh, sector in particular, um, sort of large loads shift off of oil and propane into natural gas. Um, those limited sort of uh, increases in natural gas infrastructure um, have also helped to the extent uh, to a small extent in, in reducing the overall constraints we feel during the winter when the, all of our natural gas goes to home heating and there isn't enough for power plants and we run coal and oil. So if you've seen the, the last cold snap around New Year's, if you looked at the ISO New England's fun little uh, app um, downloaded, it's fun, a little scary. The you know power prices were in the 300 plus dollar range and we were providing um, power 30 3% oil, 7% coal, so 40% from fossil because of the fact we don't have enough gas infrastructure. Um, we are moving past that because we know that's not going to happen and that's why we're doing things like our investments in clean energy, our um, grid scale um, renewables, our, um, our best in class procurement, which is attracting non-gas, non-fossil resources like offshore wind. We're in there with Massachusetts in their offshore wind procurement and we're anticipating some pretty um, impressive bids there um, that we're uh, excited about. We have our uh, additional procurement authorities that bring you know grid scale renewables and they keep going down in price. So that's where we're gonna keep investing in uh, our energy and time and resources is ensuring that we're deploying um, renewables at scale and the seeing the, the growth of battery technology and grid scale batteries that can then um, deal with the fact that many renewables are intermittent. So that's where our focus and attention is going forward. Great, okay. Uh, Millstone is a major component of Connecticut's supply of non-carbon electricity. Wouldn't it make sense to treat it uh, separately by negotiating a reasonable price for long-term supply, considering that it's difficult for the nuclear plant to, regard, uh, to respond to fluctuations? in the marketplace? So we're in the middle of a process where I, I think we issued a draft report about, uh, about just that question. Um, so for those who I guess didn't see our, our draft um, and comments are still open until Mary today. Yeah, so you know today. 
Yes, Mary. Sorry, Claire, they're today. <laughs> Nobody jump all over Mary who's standing in the um, back. So um, it is an open process, but we did issue a, a draft report that basically said our analysis of, of Millstone based on the information that we have at, at the time, they are profitable, but there are uh, sensitivities that were run based on the limited information that they gave us that they are at risk due to these market forces. Um, and so we provide a pathway through what the legislature has given us, a procurement pathway. And it's a procure procurement pathway that allows existing resources to demonstrate at, that they're at risk through the full opening of their books with audited financials. And if that happens, they can then compete uh, with the full price uh, criteria um, in the uh, evaluation of what they're delivering. and that they are actually at risk of going away by a date, date certain, which makes you think about that base case, how the market looks in a different way than what we're currently uh, assuming, that they're profitable and are staying into the future. All that said, we, we tend to agree with uh, others in the General Assembly who've been talking about the um, nuclear as a bridge as we are growing uh, the renewable fleet. And that's how we're approaching um, uh, our continued investment and focus on uh, class one carbon-free renewables and the importance of those in meeting that ambitious 45% uh, by 2030 target. You need to have um, the most uh, efficient, effective, and um, largest amount of base load clean power that you can find um, that is zero carbon. Great, thank you. Now this was for Brian. Um, given the skill and innovativeness of what you guys do, um, what ideas are kind of bubbling along for leveraging more private capital to keep you strong mm -hmm. that you can disclose? Um, so, so we're in a bit of a state of transition. You know, I, I think coming from the culture of innovation and, and in designing new products and, and developing new markets. Um, right now, we're, we're just getting uh, used to our new reality, right? So you, you all who have been in restructured environments, so we're, we're getting settled in there. Um, but one of the things that we're taking a look at is the legislature has also given us the ability to, to issue bonds uh, and to take a look at uh, private activity bonds. So I think one of the things you'll see from us in the future is the utilization of tax-exempt bond financing to support clean energy. So you could think about bonds as a low cost access to capital. How can we move more private investment to purchasing those bonds and then using the proceeds to uh, support more underserved markets that need clean energy? So stay tuned. I think you'll see us do look at bonding more. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, next to last question, what is it really going to take to protect the clean energy funds from further raiding? Like hard realism question there. <laughs> So that, that is a hard, hard question, particularly because the, I mean, the General Assembly has that power to say, notwithstanding all the things in statute, we're going to do this or, or that or the other. Um, part of our goal in this upcoming legislative session, particularly on the efficiency fund side, is to propose new models that are, are less subject to, to raid. I will highlight one that we've already used to good effect, our ability to procure efficiency as a resource. It competed in our small-scale RFP. Um, I guess a year or two ago, 34 megawatts of additional efficiency bid in one by one of the utility companies. Um, the bid process creates a, a world where you do the measures and you kind of get reconciled and paid back later. There is no pot of money. And pots of money are the things that, um, apologies to all you legislators here in the office, you can't help yourselves um, from taking them. Um, that's an, our unfortunate um, financial reality here. So those are the types of things we're going to strive um, to, to transform. That transformation is, is new uncharted territory and will require a lot of folks you know, smarter than me to come together and figure out the right way to do that in a sensible way. Because the last thing that we would want to do is take a reaction to a negative stimulus, the sweeps, and pivot to something that doesn't work. That's, that would be uh, another uh, unintended consequence that we want to avoid. So we're working hard to try to figure that out. Okay. Thank you all. Any one-liner? Uh, it wouldn't be a one-liner, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Um, thanks to both of you, gentlemen, for a very informative and uh, balanced and useful presentation. Um, and while you're making your way off stage, we're going to have the energy panel come on stage. And yay. Hello. 
I'm Jay Stan McCauley and I'm exploring a run for mayor of the city of Hartford in the 2019 election. It's undeniable that Hartford has many challenges. However, I believe that our residents are our strength. The question is, do you believe like I do in the potential of Hartford? You see the many assets the city has, but do you wonder, as I do, why we are still struggling to move ahead? Do you wonder why the solutions being offered to us just don't seem to get the job done? Well, creating a vibrant city begins with you. We have incredible people who live in the city, who have great solutions to Hartford's biggest challenges. But you don't always have a platform to have your ideas heard, let alone given an opportunity to co-create solutions that work for you, that work for us, that work for Hartford. Hartford's journey will be bumpy and we'll continue to face highs and lows that challenge us to work smarter and come together as a community that is willing to capitalize on the power of our collective diversity of thought. The challenges facing Hartford will require each of us to act, whether in small ways or big ones. If you're with us on this journey, give me a call at 860-944-9797 and host a listening event for me. Invite a few of your friends so we can explore the possibilities together for a better Hartford. I think that under the um, national administration, I think that environmental issues are under attack, and I want to do my part to uh, put a stop to it. Hi, I'm Alex Rodriguez. I'm the lead promotor of CHISPA Connecticut under the League of Conservation Voters, and I'm here today to gather amongst my peers, uh, amongst many communities in Connecticut, uh, so that we can address the environmental issues this coming legislative session. As you may know, climate change uh, disproportionately affects many people, especially in urban areas. Um, one way that CHISPA itself has uh, come about the issue of climate change is uh, through our Clean Buses for Healthy Ninos campaign. We are working to get electric buses out on the road as the new standard uh, because we believe that children should be breathing clean air on their way going to school and on their way home. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this session because I know that water management, energy development, and land conservation are amongst everybody's top priorities here. And I'm looking forward to lobby days with them at the Capitol, as well as the climate marches and rallies that we'll have this year. I look forward to seeing you all in the coming future.